Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first spring 2022 Technoglass lecture. I'm Joel Lemire, coordinator of the series and director of the graduate programs in, uh, in architecture here at University of Miami School of Architecture. Tonight, we inaugurate the spring series titled Operating in Material Conditions and Architectural Imaginaries with our honored guest, Virginia Senfratello. But before we dive in, um, it is worth stepping back momentarily to reflect on how fortunate we are to be able to bring thinkers and designers of this caliber to share their work with us. To this, we owe thanks to our series sponsor, Technoglass. Um, they have enabled this ambitious series through their continual support, and in turn, they've contributed significantly to our intellectual culture here at USOA. So thanks so much to Technoglass. Uh, one small piece of housekeeping to share. Um, as many of you know, the AI offers continuing education credits for attendees. If you're interested in receiving those credits, please email Stephen Fett at sfett at miami.edu. Um, okay, so I'm going to come clean uh, with everyone tonight. As the coordinator of this year's Technoglass series, I had one explicit agenda and one slightly more hidden. The former was pretty obvious from the outset. The fall series, titled Opting In, featured design practices that openly acknowledged the seemingly intractable and entangled issues of our moment and chose design as the primary means to those challenges. Now, that part still holds true for the spring, right? All of these speakers also will represent a broad set of voices and agendas, and all are committed to confronting big questions about architecture's agency in times of crisis. But my hidden agenda gets to peek through a little bit now, too. So the five speakers that I've assembled this semester are basically my favorites. I am unapologetically into their work. I'm standing their research and projects. So in addition to today's speaker, we will also have Felicia Davis, Brandon Clifford, Sean Canty, and Philippe Block. Not coincidentally, but beyond my mere fandom, there is a connective strand among these speakers. We move from opting in in the first semester to operating in by adding an essential wrinkle. Namely, to accomplish the revolutionary changes required of a responsible architecture, we must reinvent the matter that constitutes it. We have to consider the physical stuff that we use, imagine completely new possibilities and material palettes. This material reconstitution operates along many axes from production, composition, geometric deployment, form, structure, among others. We will host thoughtful designers who are invested in each of these avenues during the spring. They will also show us alternative models of practice, which may be necessary for materially focused thinkers who are often caught between the global need for radical change and the material realities of funding their research. Virginia Sanfrentello is the definitive example here, both as someone conducting material research at the absolute edge of the known, um, but also through her layered versions of practices that are much better suited to innovation than con conventional architectural firms could ever be. She triangulates this with pedagogy as the current chair of the Department of Design at San Jose State University and author of Printing Architecture, Innovative Recipes for 3D Printing. It is clear why she was an ideal first speaker for this spring series. Her creative architectural practice, Real Sanfrentello, co-founded with Ron Real, is widely celebrated. Its dedication to creativity and sense of playfulness has earned it many recognitions, including being named an emerging voice by Architectural League of New York, uh, and the Beasley Design of the Year Award, among others. Um, among her other ventures, she established Emerging Objects as a 3D printing think tank. She calls it a make tank, I think rightly. Um, their work is, has been published everywhere, literally, um, in popular press, including the New York Times and Wired and Metropolis, and in the slightly more niche media where I encounter it, um, such as Acadia and Architecture Newspaper. Um, the research and design of Emerging Objects to me reads as a kind of comprehensive catalog of the possible. Um, as proof of this, you can navigate their site by material, and it's worth reading the whole list. Um, acrylic, cement, ceramic, chocolate, metal, nylon, paper, PLA, resin, rubber, salt, sand, tea, and wood. All of these are, of course, 3D printed and expanding the material imaginary for our discipline. So I'm obviously thrilled uh, that she is joining us tonight, and I'm excited to bring her work into all of your lives as well. So on behalf of the uh, School of Architecture at the University of Miami and Technoglass, please join me in welcoming Virginia Sanfratello. Thank you so much, Joel, for that very thoughtful and kind introduction. 
Um, thank you so much for having me and inviting me. It's exciting to be here. This is my first time in Miami and it rained today, <laughs> but I still had fun. I went and saw a lot of amazing, really fresh, inspiring art, and I'm going to go back with some new ideas about what to make. Uh, so it was a lovely day. Um, so tonight, uh, for your first lecture of the spring semester, I'd like to talk to you about play, clay, and Chardonnay. So I'll start by talking about Chardonnay. So my practices, Rael San Fratello, Emerging Objects, uh, Forest, et cetera, are uh, located in Oakland, California. So we're uh, in the Bay Area, the northern half of California. Of course, you probably know we have a large winemaking industry there in Napa and Sonoma. And one of the important aspects of our practice is we have developed materials for 3D printing has been to think about how we use and develop local materials for additive manufacturing, but also materials that are in the waste stream. And we have been rethinking how those materials can escape the waste stream and become upcycled essentially through the process of 3D printing. So for us, Chardonnay is one of these materials. It's both local, but it is also in the waste stream because the wine making industry does not use the seeds and the skins for the wine production. Now in Italy, they use this to make grappa, which seems like a really good idea, but we don't do that in the United States. So we wondered if we could take these skins, the seeds that you see in this photograph here and pulverize them into a fine enough mesh that we could put into our 3D printers in order to create objects such as these Chardonnay wine goblets, which are literally 3D printed out of Chardonnay grape skins. We've also printed uh, a Chardonnay block here. Uh, it has a texture of a resin, uh, a raisin, sorry. And this block was designed for uh, Andrew Cutlass of Matsis, and he radially arrayed that block around to make this ice bucket for Pierre Jouet out of the Chardonnay <clears throat> that would be within the, the champagne itself. Coffee, so this is another material that is, that is both local because you know, I have coffee every morning, it's on my kitchen table, I make coffee grounds, which I throw away, but I wondered if I could recycle or reuse those coffee grounds with 3D printing. And this is also a ubiquitous waste material, right? People are drinking coffee all over the world. So the grounds that we're throwing away can be recycled and reused to make objects out of 3D printed coffee, such as this coffee, coffee pot. There is also the fruit or the cherry that surrounds the coffee bean, which is an agricultural waste material and can be reconsidered for additive manufacturing. So that cherry is removed from the bean and thrown into piles and left to rot in the field while the bean goes on its way to becoming roasted in the coffee that we're all familiar with. Uh, so instead of leaving that fruit to rot in the field, we're working with manufacturers who take the fruit, who dry it in an oven, pulverize it, turn it into a baking powder. And it does give a, a kind of caffeinated uh, woodsy flavor to the things that you bake with it. But it's also quite suitable for 3D printing, which you can see here in these uh, coffee coffee cups and we're able to print with other materials that are sticky and neighborly such as sugar which you can see in these sugar spoons that are shown in sizes that correspond to one teaspoon two teaspoons one tablespoon and beyond so you could literally just stir your 3d printed sugar spoon down into your cup of coffee in the morning to flavor it tea similar to coffee is both uh, local waste and ubiquitous waste that can be found all around the world. Tea fluff and tea solids and tea leaves are all suitable for additive manufacturing, which you can see here in these 3D printed, quite literal teaspoons, tea cups, and teapots. So this is the Utah teapot that was designed in the computer or modeled in the computer in the 1970s by Martin Newell from the University of Utah. And we thought it would be appropriate to bring this particular teapot, which is so famous in the digital world, 
back into the physical world by 3D printing it out of tea. Curry. So this, this was an unusual experiment for us, but one of the things that we were striving for as we were thinking about printing this curry was the pursuit of color. So most of the materials that we had been printing with were brown or gray, if it was cement. And we wanted to know if we could, we could find something more kind of visually outside of that more neutral palette. And so we, we decided to print with curry, which of course has a lot of turmeric in it. It's this beautiful orange color that you can see here. But what we realized was more interesting about printing with curry was that this object is absolutely aromatic. It seasons the entire laboratory that we're working in. It seasons any room that it is placed in. Now, all of these powdered materials, we post-processed on the exterior with a two-part epoxy or resin or wax in order to make these pieces strong. But in this case, we left the interior unfinished, which you can see here. So the aroma of the 3D printed furry curry casserole dish would continue to live on. And we hope that if you put rice or noodles or, or your food inside this dish, that the dish itself would season uh, the food that's placed in it. Salt. So this is another uh, local material for us in the San Francisco Bay Area. Salt has been harvested in the South Bay for over 150 years. 150,000 tons of salt are harvested annually. And here you can see the, the crystallizers in the foreground. These are the salt ponds and the big piles of salt in the background. So this is harvest. It was amazing to learn how this works, but of course the water comes into the bay, into pools, and through mostly wind and sun, uh, the water evaporates and of course the salt builds up on the pools and as it moves from one pool to another, you get greater and greater uh, densities of salt. And in October and November, we scrape the top six inches off the most dense pools. So this is kind of the end of October. So halfway through the salt harvest, just so you can get a sense of the sheer amount of salt that is captured. So this is, a very uh, readily available material. It's made just using sun and wind. Um, it's incredibly inexpensive, which is one of the reasons we decided to pursue this. And of course, it's, it's sticky and soluble and prints really well. <clears throat> and we use the salt to print functional objects such as these salt shakers, which are solid on the exterior but the salt is left loose on the interior, so you can still sprinkle the salt and season your food. A 3D printed salt is always translucent. That has very, very beautiful opt optical qualities. It doesn't matter how thick or thin you print it. <clears throat> and we've experimented with different ways of connecting and stacking to create salt structures and, and blocks, which couldn't be made any other way, which you can see here. Uh, this is uh, a model by Tom Falders, which we 3D printed for him out of salt for a building, which he was proposing would, would actually uh, grow salt on the surface. But for me, this, this also reads not only representationally, but it can read one-to-one. -one. Like these are literally blocks that can stack together to make a wall. So here are these salt uh, crystallizers, the fields out in the South Bay. And at one point, the company who owned these had about 30,000 acres. They have since uh, set aside around 16,000 acres to be restored to wetlands, but they wanted to use 1,000 acres to make homes for 30,000 people in the Bay Area, which made us ask the question, could this material, this literally, ground beneath your feet be used in the construction of those houses. Could we make a kind of salty glue or an igloo, which you see here, out of salt? And in thinking about this, we were inspired by these very traditional processes for making salt. Um, these it's kind of beautiful domes where the brine is boiled and the salt is extracted and the, the baskets themselves. 
we were inspired by the crystalline form of the salt and we used that that formal quality of the salt crystal to design a tile which we would then radially array around a, a kind of tint or an igloo form to make this very lightweight salty glue So there are around, I think, 330 of these salt blocks. Each one is unique because of the curvature of the structure itself. And in the early days, uh, we were holding these pieces together with binder clips. <laughs> so these all have little tiny flanges that are binder clipped together. Um, and if you look closely, uh, you can see there are these really thin aluminum rods that are in compression, which just help the whole tent structure stand up. So it's very, very lightweight a very minimal structure, um, very easy to take apart and put back together. And here you can see the, the beautiful optical qualities of the salt, sort of that, that diaphanous quality of the light as it passes through the salt. It's, it's very diffuse, right? But you still have light coming through the openings and the apertures. And this is it from the exterior. And we always imagined that it would be a beautiful way to think about making interior spaces, right? Where you might need privacy, but you would still want kind of diffuse, soft, indirect light coming into an interior space, maybe a bedroom or a bathroom. Sawdust, uh, this is another material which is in the waste stream. Of course, the construction industry is responsible for contributing tremendous amounts of wood waste to landfill. And of course, when we work with wood, it is almost always subtractive. And we wanted to know if it would be possible to work with wood through additive manufacturing processes. So here you can see just in this little tiny planer in someone's garage, just literally how much sawdust they make. And so we're able to take that sawdust grind it up into a flower and put it in our 3D printers, which you can see in the video and the photograph on the right. And we can make objects such as these out of the waste material. So you can imagine if you had to carve this, how much sawdust you would make, right? And sometimes we add other materials to the matrix. So for example, this has little uh, nylon fibers in it to help increase the tensile strength of the material matrix. And one thing that I really love about 3D printing with sawdust is that depending on how you orient the digital model in the printer, you can get kind of artificial wood grain in that direction because of the way that each layer builds up over time, which you can see here. When printed thinly enough, the sawdust is translucent. And we've experimented with different species of wood. So this is pine, this is walnut, and this is maple. And this is a tile in what we call the sawdust screen, which was a test for thinking about how we might use uh, car represent tiling patterns to make one simple design that would connect no matter how you rotated or repeated the tile across the surface in order to think about how we might make this interior partition. And, and the, of course the holes in it allow for light, and air, views um, through the screen itself. And we've been fortunate enough to found a company called Forest because our forests are for us. And we have commercialized 3D printing with sawdust. So if you want to 3D print something for your architecture class out of sawdust, you can. So you can upload it to our website Forest and we will print it for you. And for those of you who are here in person, I brought some 3D printed wood so you can see it. Rubber, so this is one of the world's worst waste materials. It is an incredibly durable material for obvious reasons, and that makes it really hard to recycle. Uh, just to give you a sense of the problem associated with this, this is the world's largest rubber tire landfill in Jordan. And to give you a sense of scale, see the little building, the little white rectangle at the bottom, that's a building. <laughs> so you can see this from outer space. 
So in the United States alone, I think around 290 million tires each year need to be recycled. So I think about 60% of those are recycled, but the remaining 40% are going to landfill. So what can we do with this material, right? So we've been working with a company called Lehigh Technologies that is grinding up the rubber tires into a microfine powder that we can print with. So they take the rubber tires, sometimes they freeze them, they break them down into small chunks, which is more commonly known as rubber crumb. You're probably familiar with this. You've seen it on playgrounds or maybe it gets used, ground up a little bit more, gets used in asphalt uh, to make curbs or roofs. So this is ground up even more and we're able to print with this. And this is one of our early tests. Um, it's a really hard material to work with. It is totally inert. It does not want to stick to itself. So this is actually the material that has the most um, other filler materials mixed in with it. It's still more than 50% rubber though. And we finally got better and better and we were able to print this uh, rubber poof, which is eight parts and it's large enough for you to sit on. And we imagine that it could be an example for how one might think about using 3D printed rubber furniture in a playground or maybe at a bus stop, or you could also make uh, tiles or blocks for the exteriors of buildings. Cement, this is the most widely used building material in the world, but it has to transform for additive manufacturing. <clears throat> and we've been able to do that with our patented process for 3D printing uh, cement. But you can see here in this incredibly complex geometry, it would be pretty much impossible to make this any other way. Maybe you could make a formwork and cast it if you broke it up into 16 pieces or so. But that would take a lot of time and a lot of work. So we can go from file, fabrication, and cement without any formwork. And formwork can cost up to 40 to 60% of the cost of building. So it, it also reduces not only time, but materials and money. And these are some of the objects that we've produced, testing thinness, for example, translucency again, playing around with the possibilities of connecting 3D printed cement parts to make larger structures, which you can see here, binder clip connections. <laughs> experimenting with different ways of finishing the cement. So in this case, we sandblasted it to really bring out those contours to make it matte. And here are 32 um, unique uh, pentagons and hexagons that come together perfectly to make this wall. So 3D printed cement comes out exactly dimensionally correct just as like model in the computer. Of course, one thing I really love about working this way is that the model you make in the computer, you 3D print to be your study model, is the same model that you can use to make the actual building. Uh, this is a small tinfecto that we call Bloom. It is about 12 feet by 12 feet in diameter and nine feet high. And every block is unique. There's almost a thousand blocks. And it has this very beautiful motif of flowers on it. Um, the white really becomes open and the black is closed. No, it's the opposite. <laughs> but anyway, the, the, the white is open, so you get the pattern of the leaves and the black or the negative space is, becomes the windows or the fenestration into the building, which makes for this very unique object or surface. And the interior has a completely different reading. So here you can see how the blocks are structured. So each block has a cross inside of it. And that allows us to carry the weight of those top blocks all the way down to the bottom because there is no other structure. These are completely self-supporting. And if you look closely, you'll see those blocks at the bottom are about four or five inches deep. And the ones at the top are about one inch deep. And that helped us reduce the load so that as the structure went up, the weight decreased. And because the printer doesn't care that every block is unique, we're able to do that. 
right? So here you can see those thick bottom blocks that we've laid out. Uh, we've also printed in holes so that each block can be mechanically fastened one to another. And here's the floor plan with those thicker blocks at the bottom. And then the roof plan, which shows those thinner blocks at the top. And working this way has really changed the way that we represent and produce architectural drawings. So we no longer make plans, elevations, sections, axons. The only drawing that we print is the floor plan. And we printed it full scale, which you can see here. We lay down that first row of blocks and everything else falls into place after that. So all of the blocks are alphanumerically coded and we know exactly where they should go and they fit perfectly into place. And when we take these apart, we often take them apart in chunks so that we don't have to reassemble you know, a thousand blocks again. So this might be, you know, 30 blocks that are left together. And the reason we're printing these small blocks, these eight by eight blocks, is because that is the limitation of the build bed of our printer. The block also fits nicely in your hand, so it's easy to place. And so here you can see Bloom installed on campus at the University of California, Berkeley. And here's just a little video that shows and we've been able to take all of this material development and research and test it out in what we call the cabin of 3d printed curiosities we, we had the opportunity to build this cabin in Oakland because the Bay Area is experiencing a housing crisis. Um, there's not enough housing for all the people who want or need to live there, which has made housing, of course, very expensive. Because of that, San Francisco, Berkeley, Oakland, they have all relaxed their zoning laws and their building department reviews. So you can now build up to 1,200 square feet without a building department permit or design review, which is amazing and it gave us an opportunity to build something that didn't have to have a design review so that we could test these materials that had never been used in a real building before so this is kind of a proof of concept for us so we use the different powder-based materials that we've developed on the front facade of the building in the form of these hexagonal tiles that we call planter tiles because they are designed to hold succulents which really thrive in our northern california environment so the really dark brown tiles here are made out of the chardonnay and the light brown ones are made from sawdust from the, the close by sierra nevadas and and the whitish ones are made out of cement and every once in a while we we have leftover chardonnay and cement and we just put it in the printer together turns out that works too so we have some color in between as well uh, here they are when we first put them on the building so you can see how they've aged in the last four years the east and west facades and the roof of the building are made out of uh, paste extruded clay tiles we call these our seed stitch tiles and i'm going to talk a little bit about clay in the next section of the presentation but all of these tiles are the same which you can see here but because of humidity or or maybe the wetness of the clay. Um, each one is slightly different. So as we're printing it, which you can see in the slide here, you know, it might wiggle a little bit or it might slump a little bit. And so each one is also slightly different or unique, even though it all comes from the same uh, Rhino file. But I love the way these tiles look on the building in the garden, you know, the way the sun moves across the building and it creates this lovely zigzag pattern and the way the plants are starting to grow and weave through the tiles themselves. And the interior of the cabin is printed using bioplastic, the same PLA that you use in your 3D printers here. So we have a larger printer, it has an eight foot long by four feet by four foot bed that we use to make these tiles, but it's still uh, printed out of uh, 
the bioplastic, which in the United States is mostly cornstarch based material. Um, and our idea here was to design tiles that in some way reference the kind of pressed tin tiles or ceilings that you would see in a traditional Edwardian or Victorian neighborhood, which is where this cabin is located. And of course, those tiles are referencing carved plaster from Europe. And so we have this beautiful white facade on the interior, which references these two older techniques. But what's unique here is that every tile is different. Every tile has a different floral pattern on it, unlike the pressed tin tiles. And then of course, the hand isn't used to make this, but rather the craft comes in the computer. And what's really unique about this that you can't tell or you don't know, um, if you look closely, you can see there are diamonds in these tiles and, and, and the tiles are actually large panels and there's two sizes. There's one that has six diamonds in it and there's one that has eight diamonds in it. And that six diamond tile is a, is a daytime print. And that eight diamond tile is a nighttime print. So we actually never printed something that was eight feet long by four feet tall, because we knew that that week long, that 90 hour print, if it failed in hour 89, <laughs> we would lose everything. So we decided to make a six hour print and an eight hour print so that if a print failed, we would only lose one day or one night. We also discovered that even the opaque bioplastic is translucent when backlit with LED lights. So we decided to use this as the diffuser um, for the illumination within the cabin. So we have the white lights here on during the day and the LEDs of course can change color, which change the mood and the setting of what might happen programmatically within the cabin um, from day to night, for example. And of course, all the objects in the interior are printed as well. The chairs, the lamps, the coffee pots, the coffee table, and all the objects on the back wall. And for us, this represents a new paradigm for architecture and the way buildings might be made in the future. Okay, as promised, clay. So we can't, there came a point in our practice where Saturday, wanted to work a little bit more quickly with the clay. So we had been using pulverized all clays in the same manner that I've talked about the other powdered materials, but it takes a long time to, to print a large object, maybe five or six hours, and then it has to sit in the printer for another 24 hours, right? Then the clay has to dry for another week, and it goes in the kiln, three days, glaze back in the kiln. So it can take quite a long time to make something out of clay. So we decided to move to this process called paste extrusion. And we're essentially pushing clay um, with a ram through this nozzle. And we're able to make very large prints so maybe in five minutes. One of the things that we really like about this process is that we don't have to model it in the computer. Um, we can just find that toolpath, just design the G code itself. And in the G code, we're making these rectangles that interleaver 90 degrees, but because of the plasticity and the weight of the clay, it droops. And sometimes we make that rectangle really long and it breaks, which is what's happening here. And so we actually really like these errors and mistakes that are occurring and they've become a part of the aesthetic of the way that we work with this material. So there's not a lot of difference here in terms of formal modeling. There's maybe only three different shapes here, but we're able to radically change the design just by making very small adjustments in the G code. So maybe five loops high instead of three loops high, 30 loops around instead of 15 loops around. So very, very small adjustments allow for this very radical uh, difference to occur. And of course, we've always been interested in thinking about how these smaller objects could not only be vessels that are one-to-one, -one, but how these smaller objects might actually be study models for 
ways to think about building earthen architecture, which you can see here in this, this beautiful mud building in Africa. And we've finally been able to realize that uh, over the last two or three years. So this is one of our uh, first um, pre-printed adobe or, or mud structures. So we've been able to scale up and we call this project Mud Frontiers. One, because we are working at the frontier of technology. Two, we're also working at the historic frontier between the United States and Mexico. So the site in which we're building these um, 3D printed Adobe structures is on the southern border of Colorado in, and New Mexico in the San Luis Valley. And we call it mud, of course, because we're, we're using mud, but we're also thinking about mobility, ubiquity, and democracy. So in this region, um, you can find building, well, this is the Taos Pueblo, uh, which is a building made out of mud. This is the oldest continuously occupied building in North America. It's thousands of years old and it's made out of mud. So this is an indigenous and a traditional material that we want to transform through additive manufacturing and robotics. So let's talk about mobility. We have a really lightweight, 3D printing setup. So this is our 3D printer. It's almost just like the ones that we use to make the small ceramics with. It's a little bit bigger, but it works the same way. Um, it can be picked up by one or two people, depending on how strong you are. Uh, and on the right, you can see the fabrication setup in the field. So we basically have a backhoe that's holding a hose that's connected to the printer. And that hose is connected to a continuous flow hopper. And in that hopper, we're, we're shoveling mud, right? And the hopper is pumping the mud through the hose. And the hose is connected to the robot and the robot arm is depositing the mud. Ubiquity. So we're just using the mud that's there, the soil that is literally there, the ground beneath our feet. And we know in this region, this soil has the right mixture of sand and clay, right? So we add water to it to achieve the correct viscosity and we add chopped straw, but we don't have an exact formula. We just we kind of feel it, right? So we couldn't tell you what the recipe is because depending on where you were in the world, your recipe would be slightly different, right? Depending on the sand and the clay, the loam that's in your soil composition, but it's free. <laughs> And democracy. So we have developed this software called Potterware, which runs in the cloud. It's really easy to use. You do not have to know how to 3D model. So basically you can control the profile of a form through this A, B, C, D, E line. You can control the number of waves around the perimeter. And you can export the G-code for 3D printing. So in five or 10 minutes, you have a design that's ready to print. So you don't need to spend a month learning a complicated 3D modeling software program. So we're trying to make this more accessible to more people. So we've explored this material, this technology, and the software, several different iterations, uh, which I'll walk you through. The first is called the beacon, and this is a study in lightness. So for this particular object or structure, we wanted to see if we could make just one line of clay stand up by itself. So this is one very thin, maybe three inch wide by three inch tall bead of clay, which is why it has this kind of concave and convex profile for support. And because it was lightweight, we thought we would also illuminate it and use light to highlight the texture and the coils and the surface of the building. This is the lookout and it's an exploration in structure. So you can walk on these stairs all the way to the landing on top and look out over the entire valley. And this is what it looks like inside underneath those stairs. So this is a sort of continuous line, right? There's no retraction. It's just continuous flow, uh, continuous toolpath of mud that makes this Pizzelli-like structure. And here in the 3D printed kiln, we were interested in exploring insulation. So 
This is a double layer wall and between the interior and the exterior, there's air in each of these vertical pockets, which helps insulate that space. So the opening faces south, the direction that the wind comes, so it comes into the kiln and it creates a little tornado on the inside and the fire uh, is drawn up and the smoke and the heat out. But if you touch the kiln from the outside, it's still cool. And this is where we fire our smaller objects. Uh, which you can see here. So these are some functional micaceous clay pieces. We've dug the clay ourselves. Uh, here's a tagine and some dessert cups and a bowl. So these pieces are also uh, not clay bodies that we've purchased, but they're again uh, from our own land, our own soil. And the hearth. So this one was an experiment in decoration. And in this case, it took a juniper sticks and intermittently inserted them into the structure. So there's an inner and an outer layer, uh, inner and outer coil of mud. And these juniper sticks tie those two layers together. And interestingly, that allowed us to print higher. So normally we would be able to print about 18 inches on a nice sunny windy day. And then we would have to stop for four or five hours, let that dry before we could print again. If it was an overcast kind of rainy day like today, we'd have to wait 24 hours before we could print again. So we we're really, we we're really working, you know, in tune with the climate. Um, but these juniper sticks allowed us to go a little bit higher, so maybe 20 inches instead of, or 24 inches instead of the 18. And here you can see the interior. So there's a, a 3D printed hearth and a bench where you can sit and gather around the fire. And all of this starts to object that we call the Casa Covida, which is a house for cohabitation during the time of COVID. And we were thinking about how to expand on these earlier experiments. And we decided one way we could do that with the one robot arm we have, which you see here, would be to create a fourth rail that would allow us to print you know, 18 inches high, move the robot, print another 18 inches high, move the robot, print again. So that by the time we had printed three circles, that first one would be dry and we could go back and start over. So we could print three things instead of one in the same amount of time, right? And that allowed us to create these connecting spaces. So here we are about halfway up. So there are going to be three rooms in this structure. The first is an entrance that has a hearth. It's a place for gathering around the fire, which we've already tested. And there will be a room for bathing and a room for dreaming. This video illustrates the process of extruding the clay walls, which are double layer walls. So they're both sine waves, but the frequency of the interior sine wave is twice that of the exterior. So the inner and outer layers touch, and that allows us to have just a slight uh, cantilever as the outer layer leans on the inner layer. So we can create a frustrum or a dome-like surface. And the robot arm can only print about seven and a half feet high. So we have made another innovation. We put robot arm on a box so we can get 12 feet high uh, and that's fine we can drive the robot at our smartphone so it doesn't matter if it's up there and we're down here we've created lentils out of the local beetle kill pine which we've charred in the shosugiban fashion and just continued printing over those lentils to make doors and windows here we are at the top where the oculus is at the terminus of the structure. And for us, this has been a really good exercise in thinking about how indigenous building technologies and materials can be combined with emerging digital fabrication techniques. So when you approach the cabin and you walk in, there's a door handle which is made out of cast aluminum. We, like many people, got a cat during COVID. And it turns out cat food cans are 100% aluminum. <laughs> so we decided to use this very local material 
uh, as part of our um, process of building. So we, out of the bioplastic on a small uh, Prusa printer, printed um, a master for the door handle. We cast that in Adobe, the same Adobe that we're building the Casa Covida out of, and then burnt it out with the melted down cat food cans to create the door handle. When you walk inside, here's the hearth, the room for gathering around the fire. It's warm, it has built-in seating. We printed all the, the dishes, the bean pots and tagines that go inside and can be used on the fire. These uh, bean pots, this material is micaceous clay, so it has mica in it, which gives it a really wonderful capacity to absorb the heat and the thermal shock so that it can sit directly on the fire without cracking or breaking. You can move into the room for sleeping or dreaming, as we like to call it. Here you see another uh, window with a lintel that we've printed over, it looks out to the landscape beyond. And we've also made custom textiles, worked with a local indigenous weaver and covered the bed with local churro sheepskins. We were fortunate enough to work with Josh DeFoya, who was a student that graduated in fashion design from Parsons uh, during the time of COVID. And he came home, uh, I think in some ways, not knowing exactly what he was going to do because his dream was to be a fashion designer in New York. But his aunt gave him a loom and told him he came from a family of weavers. And he has actually started making the most amazing woven textiles and we were fortunate enough to work with him. Um, and he used local churro sheep wool. He wove uh, the pillow covers themselves. And if you look closely, you can see on the orange pillows that the motif is actually the floor plan of the Casa Covia. And on the blue, and gray, and white, we have the floor pan of the room for bathing and the reflected ceiling plan as well. And here you have it, the room for bathing, um, the metal rancher's tub, which cattle use to drink in. We surrounded that with river rocks. And you can sit in this space and relax and be connected to both the ground and the sky. And finally, play. So, I'd like to talk about play today through one particular project. And I'd like to offer you some instructions on how to build a teeter-totter. So when you build a teeter-totter, the first thing you need to do is choose a site. So for our teeter-totter and our play, we chose the border wall between the United States and Mexico. So if you don't know, the border between the United States and Mexico is almost 2,000 miles long and 800 miles of border wall have already been built. They exist. And this is a product of the 2006 Secure Fence Act, which was put into place by George W. Bush. So the United States no longer has the tallest building, but we might have the longest building because this is actually made out of construction grade steel, which could be used to make buildings. So there are, are many types of border walls. Today, I'll talk about five of them. Uh, this is called a bollard wall. So this wall can be varying heights. It's used to prevent pedestrians from moving across the border. And it's also used to prevent vehicles from moving across the border. So these structural steel columns are filled with cement. And in this case, it's about 18 feet tall. Now, there's a pedestrian fence. This one is not used to prevent cars from moving back and forth across the border, but it is translucent so that the border patrol agents can look to the other side and see what's happening. So it's usually a, a metal mesh or perforated metal, some material like that. This is an anti-ram wall. Again, these can be varying heights, but they are made out of cast concrete and they go six feet below grade to prevent people from tunneling underneath. And it's pretty much impossible to ram through this wall or to cut this wall. And these are walls that are made out of Vietnam era landing mats. And these I think now are pretty much completely gone. So the leader of our last regime has replaced all of these walls. 
And this is the floating fence, which of course is designed to be lifted up so that it doesn't sink uh, completely into the dunes. But as it does start to sink, they have these amazing gigantic machines that come and lift it up and sit it back on top of the sand. The United States has spent $3.4 billion on the construction of the wall since 2006. And it's estimated that another 49 billion will be needed to construct and maintain the border wall over the next 25 years. So let's put that into perspective. What can you buy for $49 billion? Well, you can buy 300 Seattle public libraries. You could buy 500 miles of the High Line, or you could buy 350 road museums. So think about the cultural capital that this country could have if we were investing our money elsewhere instead of on a wall, which in my opinion doesn't work very well anyway, right? So you can surmount the wall in about 18 seconds. So the research to design the wall is done at Texas A&M University in the Sandia Laboratories. And they create these prototypes of the wall that have to withstand 40 tons being driven into it. So you can imagine the expense of designing and fabricating these walls and then ramming loaded vehicles into the wall. And on the other side of the wall, there's a different kind of research taking place that's very lightweight, and very inexpensive. And it's mostly composed of these lightweight mobile bridges, which can be moved around and allow someone to drive over the wall. And sometimes that works very well, as you can see in this video. And sometimes it doesn't. So this is an example of a truck that got stuck on top of the floating wall and the owners abandoned it. And then of course, there are the horrors of the wall. Since 1994, nearly 10,000 people have died trying to cross the border. And of course, in the last few years, we all remember that hundreds of children were separated from their parents at the border. Over 30 laws were waived for the construction of the wall. This is the highest law of the land. It supersedes Native American acts. It supersedes wildlife preservation acts. And sometimes because the materials and the equipment and the workers need to access both sides of the wall, sometimes the wall is built so far in to the United States that it seeds over up to two miles of land to the Mexican side of the border. And in the case of Brownsville, Texas, if the wall were built where the Army Corps of Engineers wants to put it, that would put half of the university on the Mexican side of the wall. <laughs> Other things happen at the border as, as well. Um, it's an attractor sometimes too. People come together. This is a binational yoga class. And what I really love about this is everyone in the class is in monument pose. Uh, you can see here the monument, which was one of the original markers of the border between the United States and Mexico. Uh, here, uh, a border patrol agent is buying ice cream from a vendor on the Mexican side. And he slips money to the fence. The vendor slips ice cream back through. And this seems like something that should be totally normal and nice, right? And it is, but it also constitutes illegal trade across the border. It is absolutely illegal what is happening here. People come together to play volleyball at the wall. And interestingly, the inventor of volleyball, James Nay Smith, was a friend of the inventor of basketball. And he said, Basketball was too hard, and he wanted to create a sport that everyone could enjoy that would have more equity. And volleyball has been played at the border since the 1970s here at Naco, uh, Arizona, Naco, Mexico, in the uh, Fiesta Binacionale. And it's still played today. Interestingly, though, somehow Tecate is allowed to span both sides of the border which I think for me means that the border is not only a political construct, but it is becoming a cultural construct as well, which you can see here in this commercial. The time has come for a wall, a tremendous wall, the best wall. 
the Tecate Beer Wall. A wall that brings us together. This wall might be small, but it's going to be huge. You're welcome, America. So it's these things that are sometimes horrific, right, and awful, sometimes bizarre and absurd, but sometimes really funny, right, that have inspired us to think about ways that we might comment on the current situation of the wall. So we have decided to create a collection of recuerdos or souvenirs that show different proposals for how people might engage with the wall speculatively. I want to make it clear, we are not advocates of the border. We would like to see the wall come down. So these are these are proposals that are commentary, right? Intended to make us think about what's happening there. And we've made these souvenirs, uh, things such as snow globes or keychains or postcards because they're small, right? They're diminutive and they disempower the wall by presenting it as something that is small. And we thought, what better way to think about an event or an occurrence that might happen than to propose a teeter-totter at the border wall, one that would literally suggest and infer the way that we um, engage in relations between the United States and Mexico. So what happens on one side has a direct impact and affects what happens on the other side. So this was our site that we chose for our teeter-totter. Um, it's the border wall here, the Bollard Wall, uh, in between Anapra, Mexico and Sunland Park, New Mexico. So second, after you've chosen your site, decide how thrilling or dangerous the ride should be. So in our early illustrations, we imagined a really dangerous teeter totter. So this wall is 18 feet high. Uh, the fulcrum is halfway up that, it's eight feet. The teeter totter is 40 feet long. You're lifted dangerously high into the air. Thrilling, right? We can never get permission to do this. And sometimes I wonder if it's because people saw this uh, illustration and they thought, oh no, that's not safe. <laughs> So we scaled it back uh, to be smaller. It's 14 feet long, it's two feet above the ground at the location of the fulcrum, which lifts you up four feet in the air, high enough so that your feet don't touch the ground so that it can still be thrilling. And we designed the teeter-totters to fit through those slots in between the wall, the vertical posts, which are four inches apart. So just like a guardrail or a balustrade, right? close enough together, or far enough apart, they can put your hand through, but a baby can't stick his head through. And then the handlebars and the seats could be inserted from the other side. And of course, the details matter. We worked with Colectivo Chupecki, Italia Herrera, and Juarez to fabricate the teeter-totter. And they worked with us to smuggle in the details and the design to test the fulcrum to make sure it would sit on that L-shaped bar at the bottom of the wall so that we could very quickly drop it into place and tighten that key to support it. The seats are made out of banana bicycle seats, so they're cushioned and soft, so when you're landing on the ground, it doesn't hurt. They have sparkles and stripes to bring a bit of levity and fun because this is the playground structure after all, rubber handles, which make it comfortable to hold on to, and a horn so you can catch the attention of the rider on the other side. And the teeter-totters are painted pink, a bright, vivid pink. And we did this in honor of the women who were killed in the 1990s during the femicides. So throughout Juarez, you find these crosses in the locations where the women's bodies were found. And this color is an act of resistance and it is a color of memorial so that when people in this community see this color, they know what it means. And finally, you have to test it out. So on July 27th, 2019, we took our teeter-totters to the border wall between the United States and Mexico to stab the dragon and buy the wall. And we inserted them very quick, quickly because we knew that the Border Patrol 
would be there in about five to seven minutes. We didn't know if they would let us play or if they would stop us. But it was an amazing experience. It was an opportunity for us to come together with our neighbors on the other side of the border. And it was an event filled with joy and excitement, the togetherness between adults and children. And we were able to show the world that play can be an act of resistance, that what happens on one side affects what happens on the other side, and that we have to take care of the people that we're playing with. And the women and children who came out that day, because that's mostly who was there, were very brave. And they stood in the face of the police and they told them to go away. This is our space. This is our event. And these women and children holding these incredibly inexpensive peat sticks were able to dismantle this billion dollar wall. And it reminds me that as architects, we shouldn't be thinking about the way that we design walls, but rather the spaces in between them and the people that we're designing for. In the words of Archimedes, give me a lever and a fulcrum on which to place it and I shall move the world. Thank you, Bess.